I have a grandiose title. Of course, some of the titles elsewise in this conference are just uh, not modest. <laughs> My title is merely Beyond Physics, the Emergence or the Origin and the Evolution of Life. I change it from emergence to origins. Let me tell you what I'm going to tell you, then try to tell you, as they say. Um, nobody knows how life started. I'm going to tell you how I and some others think life may have started, particularly in the sense of molecular reproduction. Then I'm going to try to tell you that the evolution of life, its becoming, is totally unprestatable and is governed by no laws whatsoever. Therefore, it's not reducible to physics. It's based on physics, but it's absolutely beyond physics. Now, I have a little thingy here, and I'm dropping things. What I have to do, oh, by the way, at 3.30... Do you want that? Yeah. At 3.30, thanks. At 3.30, uh, I'm talking downstairs in, in uh, the Monterey room, but my wife is talking up here at 3.30, so I'd stay up here and watch her talking. <laughs> There's a reason for saying that, and I'll let you to work it out, okay? Her talk will be very good. I have to go forward a number of slides, so... But at 3.30, we'll have time to go through much of this quite carefully. Forgive me, that, that was it. So, um, Bruce Damer gave us a lovely talk on the origin of life, and in fairness to Bruce, I think it was a terrific talk, but he would admit he did not get to the problem of molecular reproduction. He got to liposomes reproducing, but not to something like DNA or RNA or a set of proteins reproducing. So part of the center of the origin of life is how do you get molecular reproduction. One view of this, which is dominant in the United States, is an RNA molecule that might, for example, be a circle or sometimes not, the RNA molecule can act as an enzyme, it's a ribozyme, and it can template replicate itself. The attempts to make such a molecule have so far failed, but they might succeed. So let's hold out some hope. Uh, a man in England has made an RNA molecule that can template replicate a different RNA molecule up to 240 nucleotides. That's really quite spectacular. If they succeed in this effort, one of the deep questions is, will it be stable in evolution? And just briefly, such an RNA molecule will make mistakes when it reproduces itself, but its daughters will be full of mistakes, so be more error-prone than the parent, so make daughters that are granddaughters that are even more full of mistakes. So over a succession of generations, there's a tendency to get what might be called an Orgel error catastrophe. And there's some grounds to think that that's something big to worry about, and we don't know about it. Okay, now, I'm going to talk about the formation of collectively autocatalytic sets. So recall that in chemistry, you can have substrates and products of a reaction, or a bunch of reactions, and molecules can catalyze a reaction. To catalyze a reaction means to make it go faster. Technically, it means to make it approach equilibrium faster. It doesn't shift the equilibrium of the reaction. So here's a collectively autocatalytic set. I catalyze the formation of Mauricio out of Mauricio parts. Mauricio catalyzes the formation of stew out of stew parts. Got it? It's not so uncomfortable, it really isn't. <laughs> okay. So that's a collectively autocatalytic set. Little protein one catalyzes the formation of protein two from protein two parts, and little protein two catalyzes the formation of protein one out of protein one parts. That's a collectively autocatalytic set because nobody catalyzes its own formation. You got it? Um, I'm the author of that idea. I published it in 1971, and I stand by it, and I'm proud of it. Okay? It's only almost 50 years old. People have made collectively autocatalytic sets, so let me just tell you about one. Gonan Ashkenaz, well, I'll tell you two. Gonan Ashkenazi has a nine peptide collectively autocatalytic set reproducing in the Ben Gurion. And uh, peptide one makes a copy of peptide two, does it to three, does it to four, does it to, does it to nine, does it to one. So it's collective. So they work. Furthermore, and this is really important, gonad set is made out of proteins, not DNA or RNA. That means that molecular reproduction simply need not be based on template replicating RNA, which is what everybody in the origin of life field has felt for years. That, that claim is false. It may be one way to get molecular reproduction, but it's not necessary. So gonad has got such a set. But people have made collectively RNA sets out of RNA 
and out of DNA and out of other kinds of molecules. It's a done deal. The only way we've gotten molecular reproduction is with collectively autocatalytic sets, and it works. Now I want to tell you is that that can arise as a phase transition in a sufficiently complex chemical soup. So uh, down at the bottom, I'm going to tell you the great button thread experiment. So empty all the chairs out of the room, put 1,000 buttons on the floor. Now take a big spool of red thread. It has to be red. I promise you, if it's blue, it doesn't work. Break off a piece of red thread, pick up two buttons at random, tie the two buttons together with the red thread and put them back on the floor. Now pick up another, well, just pick up two buttons at random. It might be the original pair or one of the two original. But anyway, tie them together with another red thread. Just keep doing that. That's called a random graph. A graph is a bunch of dots connected by a bunch of lines, or mathematically, it's a bunch of vertices connected by a bunch of edges. In 1959 and 60, Erdos and Ye found astonishing properties in such systems, and you can see it here. Let me tell it to you, and then we'll look at it, if I can make the little right here. Here I've got 20 buttons and 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 threads. What happens is that as you increase the ratio of threads to buttons, so 1,000 buttons and 10 threads, 100 threads, 500 threads, 700 threads, 1,000 threads, so on, okay? You, the ratio of threads to button. All of a sudden, magic happens when the number of threads is equal to half the number of buttons because the number of ends of threads is equal to the number of buttons. All of a sudden, oh, I need to tell you this. Every now and then, pick up a button and see how many buttons you lifted with it. Got it? That's called a cluster of buttons, technically. Technically, it's called a component in a random graph. What you get is an astonishing phase transition. At 50% threads to buttons, all of a sudden, you get a giant cluster that emerges. Sort of, it just crystallizes. It's what's called a first-order phase transition. That just means if you plot threads over buttons on your way and you look at the ratio of the biggest component that you have down there, as you tune threads to buttons, it does that. It suddenly jumps upward at half for a, for a huge system. Otherwise, it's a finite effect and it's sigmoidal. Okay, now I want to use that and I want you to get the intuition. If you connect enough things, they'll all get connected. That's the bottom line, okay? So, they're, 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 so now, so I want to tell you a model that I invented in 1971, and it's now absolutely nailed mathematically and algorithmically. What I wanted to imagine is I've got a bunch of molecules. So I took um, a molecule, a linear molecule that has two kinds of monomers, A and B, so up to length n, like n might be 10. So there's all possible combinations of A and B, all A's, all B's, A, B, A, B, 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 A, and so on and so forth. Then I wanted to model <coughs> reactions. Well, I can take a, a string up to length 10, and I can, I can glue two strings together, right? That's called a, a ligation reaction. And I can take a string and I can break it into part. I can call it a cleavage reaction. So there's a reaction graph that consists in, I'll show you one in a bit, it consists in molecules that are substrates and products. Um, and the, the substrates and products I draw as dots, then the substrates have arrows that go into boxes that are the reactions, and then there's lines that go from the reactions to the substrates. I should, I should have this to show you, and I will in a moment. It's what's called a bipartite graph, because every dot has inputs only from boxes and vice versa. Then I want a model of which polymers catalyze which reactions. Well, if you actually had a box of proteins and you knew which protein catalyzed which reaction, or RNA, I'll talk about protein, but it could be RNA, you could ask, is there an autocatalytic set in that set of molecules? That's a perfectly answerable question. I made a very simple model. I just said, let every polymer have a chance P, one in a million, say, of catalyzing each reaction. Got it? So I just pick up a polymer and I say, Bill, do you catalyze reaction 17? And if so, I'm going to draw a little dotted arrow from Bill to reaction 17 and just keep going until I've done it for all the molecules. Then I ask, is there an autocatalytic set? Well, I'm now going to tell you that you get the, the Erdos-Renier phase transition in this space, too. And the reason for it's pretty simple. Um, what happens is uh, that as you increase the length of the longest polymer, n, from 5 to 10 to 15 to 20, the number of possible polymers is easy to count. It's 2 to the n plus 1. The number of reactions is more than that. And it's easy to see that, too. A polymer length n can be broken in n minus 1 ways internally at bond. So there's more ways to make it. 
And as N gets longer and longer, the ratio of uncatalyzed reactions to molecules goes up and 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 up. And then it follows that when the ratio of uncatalyzed reactions to polymers is high enough, for any given probability that a polymer catalyzes a reaction, so many reactions will be catalyzed that you'll get the same phase transition we talked about before for Erdos and Renier. And out of nothing, you get the spontaneous creation of collectively autocatalytic sets. And you do. And here's what one looks like. So here's one um, that was done with Don Farmer and Norm Packard in 1986. And what you've got here are circles surrounding molecules and dots representing reactions. And for example, I can't read it from here. I can read it from here, though, if I get down. Uh, the molecule at the bottom is BAA, BAB, and it's made by BA and BAB. You see little lines. There's little lines from BA and BAB. That's BAB, I think, and BA. There's little lines that come into that dot that represents the reaction that glues BA and BAB together to make BA, BAB. So this is a collectively autocatalytic set, and catalysis is shown by a dotted arrow that comes from that polymer to that reaction. And I promise you that's a collectively autocatalytic set. They just pop into existence. So how are we doing on time? I've taken quite a bit of time to tell you about this. So I'm going to tell you one more idea. Oh, I've already told you. Gonan had such a set. Uh, Niles Lehman has taken a set of 16 ribozymes, cut them in half, separating the catalytic site from the, uh, from, the, uh, <coughs> from the recognition site, put them in a pot, and you get the spontaneous formation of collectively autocatalytic sets. We're not far. We haven't got it from random libraries of RNA molecules or protein molecules, but I think we're not far. OK. Uh, OK, now, I want to talk about one other big topic. If you look at your metabolism, you have hundreds of kinds of small organic molecules that convert into one another by a complex set of reactions. And every reaction is catalyzed by somebody. They're all catalyzed by proteins that are encoded by the, the genome. Where in the origin of life did we ever get a connected metabolism? I, I promise you nobody's thinking about this. So I'm going to try to tell you one set of ideas, and essentially it's a cousin of what I've already told you. So let's go forward. So here's a reaction graph, like the one I just mentioned to you. Dots are substrates and products. So that's two substrates and two products, and a little white box is the reaction. So every dot has a line that goes to a box, and every box has lines that go to, to dots. So it's a, called a bipartite graph. By black, I mean that the reaction occurs, but it's very, very slow. It's, whoops. It, it, it just means that the reaction is uncatalyzed. So I'm showing you the reactions, and I want you to see that there's a little network of, of substrates and products going to one another. And it's a little, it's a, that's what's called a reaction graph. A real reaction graph might have hundreds and hundreds of molecules and thousands and thousands of reactions in it, and nobody knows what that reaction graph looks like for real organic molecules. Christoph Flamm at the University of Vienna and others are now working on that, but we don't know yet. It's easy to work out for polymers, but not for organic molecules in general. Now, suppose that somewhere magically, I throw some catalysts at the system, and four of the reactions are catalyzed. OK, so there's my four catalysts, catalyst one, catalyzing first reaction, and I'm going to color the lines for the reactions orange, meaning that, that reaction is catalyzed now. It's like the red thread. Got it? And catalyst two catalyzes the reaction up here, and I got four more lines, and catalyst three is catalyzing that reaction. So your eye will pick up the fact that there are three little red clusters of reactions, but they're not connected to one another. I haven't told you where I got the catalyst, so I'll come back to that in a minute. Suppose I add some more catalysts that might catalyze more reactions. Well, then I'll catalyze more reactions because they might, by some probability, and you get something that looks like that. And your eye will pick up the fact that there's now a big red connected structure. I think we can do this experimentally. The candidate catalyst, I need candidate catalysts. And the obvious thing to use as candidate catalysts are random peptides made by synthesizing random DNA and making random RNA and random proteins. So just take a library of random peptides. That's trivial to do now. Uh, it's an invention that was made some years ago, and we can just go do that now. If you catalyze that reaction graph, then one of the exciting things is you could tell that you'd had a connected graph because if you labeled an atom in the ammonia and there was a catalyzed corrected reaction, if that labeled atom or that labeled nucle nucleus 
um, might wind up like a proton, labeled a proton, or a nucleus like N13 or C14 or something like that, might show up up here in that big molecule. So you knew there was transport on the graph. So these are doable experiments, and a group of us are getting together to try to design exactly these experiments. Summary of that is, I think we can try to study whether or not metabolism as a rose, as getting a big connected metabolism is the Erdos-Renier phase transition. Otherwise, we don't know where we got a big connected metabolism from. Do I know that that's right? Of course not. I just want you to hear the ideas. Now I'm going to jump to... Oh, well, hang on. If we got that far, then I'd like the peptides in the autocatalytic set to catalyze the reactions. Those are the yellow lines. Then I'd like the metabolism to help the collectively autocatalytic set as there, namely to be the food stock for the collectively autocatalytic set. Then I'd like to imagine that all of that makes lipids so that you can make a liposome and you've got a protocell. So I'm sketching for you how to get to a protocell, and I think these are doable experiments in the next 15 years. Let's hope that something like this works. Now, suppose you've got a protocell. Oh, I needed to tell you. Bruce Damer told you about getting multilamellar lipids that can form these hollow lipid vesicles. They're called liposomes, or multilamellar liposomes. Um, and they can grow and bud and grow and bud and grow and bud. Uh, and that, that would give you something like a protocell. So here's a sketch of a way to get protocells. Now I want to try to show you in the last few minutes um, that So I'm going to tell you a children's story, and I've got four minutes to tell you the children's story. Well, a long, long, long time ago, 3.6 billion years ago, in a lagoon in, as, as you were told by Bruce, in Western Australia, there were some protocells living in the lagoon, and there was Patrick and Rupert and Sly and Gus. And there's a children's story, okay? So guess what happened? Well, they're floating in a lagoon, and there's water going back and forth very slowly, and the protocells just eat the stuff that's sloshing back and forth in the lagoon. And they're all perfectly happy, but do you know, and there's many kinds of protocells, but do you know what happens to Patrick one day? You'll never guess. Well, one day he feels a hurt in his tummy, and he goes, ow, ow, what's that? Oh, no, woe is me. And a little peptide sticks out of his tummy, and he says, <gasps> oh, no. And then do you know what happens? The peptide gets stuck to a big, huge rock, and Patrick says, oh, woe is me, I'm stuck to a rock, I can't float free in the lagoon with all my friends. If, what am I gonna, if only I had a mom, I could write my mom, but I don't even have a mom. And he's really miserable and unhappy. And then, do you know what happens? You'll never guess. Now he's stuck to a rock, it's a huge rock. Well, it's actually a tiny rock, because he's really tiny, but it's not even as big as the thimble. Well, he looks around and sloshing at him from the left and from the right so fast he can't even gobble it all up. There's more food per unit time than he's ever seen before because the food's moving in the lagoon and he's stuck in one spot. And he gobbles 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 and he gobbles. And guess what happens? He gets full sooner than he would have before and he divides faster. So he then makes two Patricks and they're stuck too. And they say, oh no, we're stuck on the same rock. Well, what just happened to Patrick? Patrick has become the very first sessile filter feeder in the universe. He's like a clam. Now, that's what happened to Patrick. I have time to just tell you a couple things. Next comes along Rupert, and Rupert can, can poke holes in protocells, but he doesn't find very many out in the lagoon because they're all going at the same speed he is. One day he happens into the Patrick patch and he's just miserable. He says, what am I, what are these things? I don't want to be here. I want to be out in the open lagoon. And then he pokes a hole in Patrick, the 4,794th, who says, Gah! And Rupert says, cool. And Rupert becomes famous in the entire lagoon as Rupert Raptor Protocell. Okay? <laughs> so, so Rupert has become the very first predator in the universe and this is the very first food chain in the universe, and it changed the becoming of the universe. Now, I want to close with just a couple things, and I've got just a couple seconds. What does it take for some, Rupert has an opportunity. Rupert's opportunity is Patrick. What does it take for something to be an opportunity? There has to be a for whom it's an opportunity to, 
Rupert can seize the opportunity. That's why there's an opportunity for Rupert. Patrick can seize his opportunity by heritable variation and natural selection, and so can Rupert. Rupert's become for whom's. Rupert becomes the first predator in the universe, and, and, and Patrick is a for whom too. Notice that Patrick doesn't have any living things in his opportunity space, but Rupert has Patrick. We are creating our opportunities for one another as we evolve. So, does the, so is the global economy creating the goods and services that provide the niches for more goods and services. Economists seem not to know this, but it's true. It's fundamentally true. The, the web created a context for eBay and Amazon. So there is a, and now I will ask you, do you think you could write a model for the becoming of Patrick? Could you write down the equations by which Patrick emerges? And I claim you could not. You have no idea whatsoever, whatsoever, what the relevant variables would be. So you can write no equations for the becoming of Patrick or a Rupert, but they became exactly the way I told you, because I wouldn't fib. This is an important children's story. Thank you. Uh.